The last few years have been joyous but difficult ones. When the first building was built in 1866, few of the members would have guessed that it would be gone only 30 years later. However, the members seized the opportunity to expand as they had already felt the older building too small for their growing community. Not even two years after the devastating tornado, a new building arose along Lime Kiln Pike. Adjacent to the parsonage, it would see JUMC through the next half century. Take yourself back over 100 years to the year 1900. It's the turn of the century, the beginning of a new age. The automobile has just arrived upon the scene, but the airplane is yet to come. On Sundays at Jarrettown Methodist Church, however, most members walk from their homes. Throughout the first half of the 20th century, Jarrettown Methodist Episcopal Church had 16 pastors who served for an average of two to three years each. Reverend Charles Magarum served for six years and Reverend Prowse served for 17 years. Starting in 1900, the church fathers began selling burial plots to further the development of the church cemetery. Proceeds from the sales of plots went to the Parsonage Sinking Fund to be used toward the debt on the Parsonage property. In 1902, $50 would cover the cost for an 8 by 12 burial lot. The official board continued to be concerned about the cemetery. It was moved and seconded that hereafter, on account of damage done to the cemetery, no chickens would be allowed to be kept at the parsonage. But on a serious note, provisions were also made that the section would be paid $1 a year to take care of the Cox burial plot. Mr. Cox had been a veteran of the War of 1812. Reverend J.W. Simmons was pastor from 1907 to 1909 when he accepted a call to be a missionary to India. During his pastorate, the basement of the church was hand dug by members of the congregation and converted into a social hall. The church at this time was the social center for the young people and their families. Official board minutes cite two-day autumn carnivals, strawberry and peach festivals, elocutionary entertainment, oyster socials, and rabbit suppers. Mention is made of thanking the church members who kept the rabbits and the boys who shot them. During the years 1910-1911, a supply pastor was appointed to the church. He preached every Sunday except one when the pulpit was filled with representatives from the Anti-Saloon League. Reports later circulated against the character of this pastor, and it was suspected that he had a still in his backyard. This gives a new meaning to the title of Supply Pastor. From its beginning, our church has been very concerned about the spiritual growth of our children and youth. Sunday school was taken seriously, and absentee scholars had to present proper excuses from home regardless of sickness, travel, or very severe weather. Sunday school minutes show that various reward methods were used in an attempt to increase the attendance. It was voted to adopt the cross and crown pin system on June 1, 1910. This replaced books as rewards for good attendance. On the fun side, many school picnics were held at Willow Grove Park. In 1912, William D. Prefontaine resigned as superintendent of the Sunday school after 25 years. In 1915, when he returned to speak at a rally to celebrate Jarrett Town's 50th anniversary, he talked at length about how the strength of the church comes from the Sunday school. He spoke of how children who attended classes in the 1880s and 90s were now leaders and teachers. This picture depicts a 1911 Sunday school class. Some of these young people became leaders in the 1940s. William M. Taylor was confirmed in 1912 as the new superintendent of the Sunday school and served for 30 years. The Sunday school's increased attendance generally reflected the trends of expansion in the community. One of Mr. Taylor's innovations to improve attendance and increase the offering was to adopt the banner system. The Sunday school class that had the largest attendance for the year had the honor of hanging the banner in their Sunday school classroom the next year. In 1916, B. Detweiler was one of the first entries on the Jarrettown Sunday school cradle roll. 
As a child, she was a regular attendee in Sunday school and she has remained an active member of our church. During the history of the church, many of the pastors were spiritually aggressive and revivals were common. In the summer of 1914, Reverend A. Britton Peterson held Sunday evening lawn services. These were guaranteed to last one hour with good, spirited singing. A proud moment occurred after church on November 15, 1917, when the official board accepted Mrs. Johnson into the membership of Jarrett Town. She was our first African-American member. In 1919, new memorial windows were placed in the Sunday school rooms and vestibule. During the pastorate of Reverend Alexander Gibb Graham, a considerable number of new members joined the church and the church school. In 1921, electric lights were installed in the church and the parsonage. Mrs. Viola Maxwell was a very dedicated Christian who attended all Sunday and Wednesday evening services. She kept the church warm by tending to a coke and coal-fired heater. Many days, she walked back and forth to her home near the corner of Lime Kiln Pike and Dillon Road, where the synagogue now stands. She also rang the bell in the tower by pulling a rope, which she sometimes would let a young man pull. She was often seen in the basement washing dishes as well. When Mrs. Maxwell was appointed sexton, it was recorded in the board minutes that the pastor asked for a pair of pliers be acquired for her use. Brother Engel offered to donate a pair of these pliers. She became a member in 1933. Many members remembered the church through legacies. When Emma Willard died, the small sum of money found in her purse was given to the church. Charles T. Cox, a veteran of the War of 1812, willed the remainder of his estate to the church following the death of his wife. Mrs. Carrie Catawater, a faithful attendant for years, also left the legacy, and Hannah Shea remembered the church in her will. Reverend Charles Margarin, one of Jarrettown's long-serving pastors, began his service in 1922 and stayed through 1928. By our 60th anniversary, Jarrettown had 114 members and only $375 of debt on the church property. The growing church decided to expand the basement. Members were also interested in church history, and in October 1924, the original deeds of the church property, cemetery, and parsonage were found, along with the church charter from 1895. Reverend Magarum was followed by W.A. Ellis from 1928 to 1930, and Reverend Maurice Outland from 1930 to 1932, whose wife practiced her operatic arias in the parsonage. While teaching courses at Brown Preparatory School in Philadelphia, the Reverend Clarence Prouse served as minister from 1932 to 1949. Modernization came to Jarrettown during his pastorate. There was a unanimous vote by the women to install an indoor lavatory, and improvements were made in the basement of the church. You may recognize some of the women who were active at that time. Betty Arnholt, Betty Taylor, Mildred Smith, Ruth Klein, and Margie Biderman. The Epworth League was organized at Jarrettown in the 1890s. It was the forerunner of today's youth fellowship organization. In the 1930s, the Epworth League at Jarrettown was very active, attending many rallies with leagues from other churches, and the young people spent much time together at social events. These events included boating at Forest Park Chalfont and picnics in Willow Grove Park. The league's inspiring motto was, Look up, lift up. One edition of the district newsletter, Newsbag, records one marriage and five engagements within the Jarrettown Epworth League. In the 1950s, the Epworth League became known as the Methodist Youth Fellowship. As early as 1938, Marion Engel and Betty Arnholt had been advocating for the official board to purchase a new organ. Four years later, an Everett Orgatron organ was purchased for $150. Mrs. Harriet Biderman served as choir director and organist at Jarrett Town for many years and was instrumental in the formation of a volunteer choir to sing during the services. In the 40s, the first gown choir was instituted. In 1947, the first daily vacation Bible school was held. 
By 1951, there were 78 pupils with 11 teachers and three aides participating in the week-long session. The theme, Ceiling Unlimited, took the children on a flight around the world where they walked and talked with boys and girls from many lands. The Reverend Richard Neuendorfer came to Jarrett Town in June 1949 after serving as a chaplain in the U.S. Navy. In February 1950, he had an automobile accident while on his way to school at Princeton Theological Seminary. The car was demolished and the pastor suffered severe injuries and was hospitalized for many months. The former minister, Reverend Prowse, and students professors from Princeton filled the pulpit. Fully recovered, Reverend Neuendorfer returned to his pastorate duties and posed with the official board in the sanctuary. Meanwhile, the men's Bible class appointed Mr. Gibbs chairman of a committee to solicit funds to replace the pastor's damaged automobile. Over $1,000 was raised, and a two-year-old 1948 Chevrolet was purchased from the Briner Company in Jenkintown. In 1951, the Jarrettown men held their fellowship dinner in the basement of the church. Shortly thereafter, a special meeting of the official board was called where it was announced that Reverend Neuendorfer was to return to active duty in the U.S. Navy. He was ordered to report to Newport, Rhode Island in January 1952. In January 1951, the church began partial support of the Reverend and Mrs. Everett Leroy Woodcock, a missionary couple in the Belgian Congo. The support continued into the 1970s. They described their work in Africa, where he was superintendent in the Kenin district. The mission station had a large chapel, separate schools for boys and girls, a medical aid dispensary, and facilities to improve farming. Reverend Calvin R. Myers arrived at Jarrett Town in 1953. A new addition to the congregation arrived in August when the pastor and his wife welcomed the birth of their son, Calvin R. Myers, Jr. <coughs> Reverend Myers made some changes which we still see today. Morning services were changed from 1045 to 11, and ushers were appointed for the morning services. With the rapid growth of the church, more space was needed for Sunday school classes, and the church school classrooms adjacent to the sanctuary had to be used for the overflow. New Sunday school classroom areas were created in the basement by hanging curtain dividers. There was still a concern about crowding, and a planning committee proposed the building of six new Sunday school classrooms to be attached to the existing church at a cost of $15,000. This committee also proposed redecorating the interior of the church sanctuary, which would cost an additional $3,000. Reverend Myers was unable to witness the building process as he was appointed to another position toward the end of 1958. Our small country church continued to have growing pains and there was additional space needed for parking. Mr. Alfred Gerbron, a member of the church who lived adjacent to the property, donated a 35-foot strip of land which helped solve the parking problem. In January 1959, the Reverend Kenneth L. Bill Sr was appointed as the first full-time pastor at the Jarrett Town Church. He arrived with his wife, Anne, and two sons, six-year-old Kenneth Jr. and Keith, age three. The church continued to grow through many of the same activities we treasure today. There was fellowship in stimulating Bible studies and trips to the Billy Graham Crusades. The Sunday school classes included the 7108 Sunday school class and dinners together to feed the soul. Outreach efforts included the Needlework Guild, Scouting, and Youth Choir, and the Women's Society of Christian Service performed services to the community and congregation. Jarrettown members working together and celebrating the sacraments together and special holidays throughout the year. When Pastor Beale arrived, the congregation was in the midst of a building crusade promising more than $45,000 over the next three years. By May of 1959, the building committee reported to the official board that there were nine votes in favor of renovating the existing structure and five votes in favor of constructing a new Sunday school building. Some members abstained. However, at a congregational meeting in June, plans were presented for adding to the present structure. 
At the time, it was reported that the conference would not approve any additions to the present structure, nor give any money towards the costs. There were also plans at the State Highway Department that showed Lime Kiln Pike would be widened to a four-lane highway. The final vote indicated 45 in favor of building a new facility and 36 votes to add to the existing building. In June 1960, a congregational meeting was held when 73 people voted to approve the new building plans knowing that the church had secured a $60,000 note, had $20,000 in the bank, and would receive a $25,000 grant from the Philadelphia Conference Missionary and Extension Society. A new sign was placed out front of the church along Lime Kiln Pike that announced the new building to the community. The members of Jarrettown Methodist Church looked forward to the construction of the new Sunday School Education Building. It was a beautiful day for the groundbreaking service for the new educational building on Sunday, December 4, 1960, with the congregation and the conference leaders in attendance. The district superintendent, Dr. Alexander K. Smith, and Dr. Paul Poley from the Philadelphia Conference Missionary Church Extension Society participated. Members of the building committee dug out shovels full of earth. Howard Street, Fred Fernsler. As the congregation watched, the cross appeared in the ground. Construction took place through the spring, summer, and fall of 1961. Construction crew, Keith and Ken Bill Jr. The new Christian Education Building was completed in late 1961 at a cost of over $100,000, which included the interior furnishings, the architectural fees, landscaping, and paving of the parking area. The building was consecrated on Sunday, November 5th at 11 a.m. with the Rev. Alexander K. Smith and Rev. Kenneth Beale and the Rev. Paul Poley participating in the service. The building was officially named the William M. Taylor Educational Unit in recognition of Mr. Taylor's many years of leadership and devotion to the church school. God has blessed Jarrett Town United Methodist Church in so many ways. Our church is now ready to meet the needs of the rapidly growing community. <laughs>